Where would you delineate the difference between DevOps and DevOps? Like, is it strictly like JavaScript tooling is is DevOps and then everything else might be DevOps or like repo management can be something that a team takes advantage of, for example, which side would that be on? And what are your thoughts on YAML? (laughs) Uh, Well, shots fired. (laughs) (laughs) Nice. Bandwidth for Changelog is provided by Fastly. Learn more at Fastly.com. Our feature flags are powered by LaunchDarkly. Check them out at LaunchDarkly.com. And we're hosted on Leno Cloud Servers. Get $100 in hosting credit at Leno.com slash Changelog. What's up, party people? I want to introduce AWS Amplify as a new sponsor here at JS Party. Amplify is a suite of tools and services that enable developers to build full stack, serverless, and cloud based web and mobile apps using their framework and tech of choice. Amplify is built to make front enders successful because you can use your existing skill set to build full stack apps that in the past would require deep knowledge around back end, DevOps, and scalable infrastructure. Amplify simplifies all of that. Amplify gives you easy access to hosting, authentication, managed GraphQL, serverless functions, APIs, machine learning, chatbots, and storage for files like images, videos, and PDFs. Check the link in the show notes for details or head to awsamplify.info slash dsparty. Again, awsamplify.info slash dsparty. Welcome, everyone. You're listening to JS Party, a weekly celebration of JavaScript and the web. We record live on Thursdays at 1 p.m. U.S. Eastern. That's 10 a.m. Pacific. Join in on the hijinks in the JS Party channel of our community Slack. It's totally free. It's totally cool. Head to changelaw.com slash community and sign up today. Let's do this. Hey, it's party time, y'all. Hello, everybody. We're so excited to be back this week. Uh, episode number 152. My first time emceeing. So if the show is horrible, you can just blame me. It's going to be amazing. Apologies in advance. <laughs> but we're really excited to have a very special guest here today. Jonathan Kramer uh, is going to be here with us and we'll get into his backstory in a little bit. But on the panel with me today is Divya. Hello, hello. And Nick. Hoi, hoi. Hey, hey. Um, and we're so excited to have Divya here on a show that's about DivOps. So um, <laughs> we'll have to get all the bad puns out of the way now. Yes. Div, yeah. <laughs> Div, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Div, yeah. There you go. Yeah. So you, so I sorry. think Jonathan came prepared for that one. <laughs> Very good. Uh, Very good. Yeah. So uh, Jonathan is yes. here because we had a show with Ben Elegbadu a few weeks ago where we were talking about TypeScript and Ben brought up this term called DivOps. And, you know, we all leaned into that. We're like, DivOps? And he's like, yeah, you know, I have a friend and he's trying to like make it a thing and I'm trying to help him. And, you know, I'm like, well, you know, it's a thing now. So that's a thing. So, yeah. Welcome, Jonathan. What, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, so, Ben and I uh, worked at Eventbrite together. So, he actually uh, brought me on to Eventbrite, uh, which, is, which was really fun. So, that's where uh, how we're friends. Uh, and we used to see each other at conferences all the time where we'd talk about DevOps things at the time, but we hadn't quite coined that term. So, uh, yeah, basically kind of the DevOps thing happened because inside of Eventbrite, I'm on the front end infrastructure team. And that's kind of, I think, one of the more common terms you hear or like in for describing a team that does the kind of work that we'll talk about what DevOps does, but Kyle Welch, uh, my coworker and now manager, we used to talk about this all the time. And like, so I'm on front end infrastructure. I'm technically like a front end developer. You know, I've been doing, I've been writing code for 10 years, a, a lot of back end stuff, C sharp, cold fusion into Node and JavaScript, tons of JavaScript. But front end wise, like I actually don't write that much front end code anymore, right? Like I use JavaScript. I prefer TypeScript now uh, to do that. Yes. Um, yes, of course. Uh, but I don't actually write much client side facing front end code anymore. I use front end tools to build tools that allow other front end engineers to kind of do their job. 
to for because we're a big React shop. Uh, so you know th that's it's it's complicated. There's a lot of stuff that goes into building a web page today. Uh, and I know we'll talk about it here in a minute, kind of what led up to that. But so yeah, we were sitting there talking. And we're like, what do we call ourselves? So I sort of tweeted out, you know, and asked the community, and we got a couple of different answers. And some people said front end SRE, front end ops, uh, still front end engineer. The most popular one actually was front end DevOps, and it's old that I ran. It had about 800 votes, and that still I was like, eh, it's that's fine. Front end DevOps sort of makes sense, but. Then actually what happened was this guy, Enrique, was was the one, Enrique Staling on Twitter. He said, front engineers who manage info should be called div ops. And he actually put the angle brackets in there. And I just latched onto that immediately. And I was like, oh my God, that is amazing. Just div ops. And the moment that that, that kind of came up, like I started going to some conferences. We went to this conference called Connect Tech in Atlanta. And I started pitching the idea there. And everybody was like, oh, this is amazing. Like, you got to do something with the... Uh, so Kyle and I started this DevOps community uh, on Slack, and I sort of blogged about it on my personal blog. And um, there is a DevOps.dev website that's terrible because I'm not a front-end engineer. Because, yeah, you're, you're yeah, ops, right? Yeah, because I did an amazing <laughs> GitHub action less. build pipeline, though, to, to merge from master it does GitHub action. So, like, the CI is fantastic. But yeah, so DevOps just to me is is like what um, is all is goes in all this tooling that, that we have to write. To, to get all the other folks that work on front end um, stuff, get their stuff to the internet, get it so people can see it. You know, nobody sees my stuff necessarily, but the people see the stuff that I help, you know, get out there. Um, yeah, so you're the pipeline. Um, yeah, yeah, we build the pipeline. You know, it's, it's Webpack, it's Babel, it's, you know, maybe looking into Parcel, it's Docker, it's CI, it's Jenkins, it's deploying things, it's S3, it's Kubernetes, it's all that stuff. So it's a, it's a whole lot. Like we could I go on all day about it, but that's kind of in a nutshell, sort of how how it came to be. So yeah, I'm just really happy you're adding semantics to the least semantic HTML tag. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <right. laughs> exactly. I mean that that's I, I would expect nothing else, less again from from the ops world, you know. <laughs> sure, <laughs> sure. HTML, yeah. what? Well, no. So Jonathan, that's that's super cool. I mean, if you think about it, like this is definitely a job that wasn't a thing like ten years ago. Right. Yeah, or even five exactly. years ago, perhaps. And so it's interesting how much like the tooling landscape and the mind share required has shifted the job market and like focus, right, of, of, of right. developers. And for companies working at scale um, with huge front end teams, there's typically a front end infrastructure team and, right. or a front end and typically like a front end platform team that's like supplying a exactly. bunch of components and then folks working on builds and pipelines and all the DX like developer experience uh, workflows. And so it's really great to see Eventbrite like as, you know, has made that a thing as well. Yep. I feel like most people who are doing it now sort of fell backwards into it, right? It was like, we were all writing jQuery code eight years ago and doing things like the revealing module pattern mm -hmm. and using ifies. And, and all of a sudden you just got all these cool, like, you know, guys writing about modern job or JavaScript architecture back then, Nicholas Zakis and writing books on all that. And then Backbone came out and then that was like, oh my God, Backbone is amazing. You know, we've got to build all this infrastructure around that, models, collections, and then Marionette or, and then like require JS, you know, and then you had to learn how to not only have to stop concatenating files and, and do all that. And so we just sort of just, just, this natural evolution became more and more complicated. And so, yeah, a lot of us just sort of fell backwards into it. And then I just was like, this is awesome. I, I just want to do this. I don't really want to write code as much that people see. I, I like building this tooling chip pipeline way better. Mm -hmm. um, it's just fun. So yeah, when I think back on all the things that led me here, it's like, and, and funny enough, like we're actually still deprecating backbone code here at Eventbrite, but that was really, I think, where I first sort of started getting into having to figure out, like, we've got all these backbone models. I remember one of the, the, the dumbest things, I remember in 2010, having this ginormous long, 10,000 line backbone application because I didn't know how to actually concatenate things at the time. I still have a stack overflow flow post from like 10 years ago that I'm like, how do I take all these files and put them into one? <laughs> and I don't even remember what the answer was at the time, but somebody turned me on to something way back then. It was Probably grunt or it's, it's it wasn't guess. it was the foregrunt. It was like uh, <laughs> some Java thing that, that would compile the 
what was that? I don't even remember. I'll have to go back and look on Stack Overflow. Oh. Wow. But yeah, then we had to like, I had to build that pipeline to take a bunch of files and squish them into one. And that's where like the revealing module pattern and all those early JavaScript patterns came in so that you weren't leaking onto the global namespace uh, and all that. And then when Grunt came out, obviously that was, that was the game changer, right? It's like suddenly we're like, oh, wow. Now I have like an official way of doing this whole thing where like I'm going to take now all these required JS modules and you know, trace the dependencies, run RJS, uglyfy things, build my CSS, and grunt this, grunt all all the things. And um, yeah, that was really, I think, one of the first times when I realized, like, this is becoming a thing. Yeah, um, yeah, no, it, it really is. And so, like, grunt, like, just kind of taking a, a step back into the history of these tools, grunt was, like, the first JavaScript task runner. It was created by Ben Altman, a uh, cowboy on GitHub or on the internet in general. Um, ben, ben is just a really brilliant engineer. I think he's uh, currently a uh, principal engineer at Toast, I believe. But um, but he worked at Boku uh, for a number of years, which is a company that I, I worked at. Yeah. And he, like the iffy pattern is actually also something that Ben kind of invented and like socialized nice. throughout the community. So it's interesting to see the history there. But mm -hmm. um, so we have Grunt and then we had Gulp, you know, and, and so it's interesting to see like what the evolution was because Grunt like ran everything serially and then Gulp was quote unquote better because, you know, it, it you know, it, yeah, it streams and, yeah. and, and, and lets you do and more piping. concurrent Piping, mm -hmm. yeah. And then and then you could write in JavaScript, so there wasn't this weird other syntax that you needed to learn, and you could integrate, the, you know. So it's interesting to see how that, like, evolution has come through. Yeah, definitely. All the way to React, you know, where I think that was one of the, f the first, if not, yeah, I think it was the first JavaScript library that really couldn't copy-paste into the web, right? You ha Like, you, couldn't, you can't just take that source code and, like, you can't just take, re uh, like, JSX and just, like, copy paste into the browser. So compiler always required, um, yeah. you know, and that was a very big shift for the community. And one that I'm still mm -hmm. personally, like I'm, I think promise is still pending for me on like whether it's a good thing or not, but I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> what was the question? I totally missed what you said. In the like, beginning. Oh, oh, you spaced out. Oh yeah. That's okay. I forgive you. No, the question is like <laughs> react. Like, do you think the fact that like, React is a tool that you can't even run in the browser, right? It's, it's like you like you can't write React code without a compiler, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not even... Well, you could. Yeah, I was about to say, you could. You It'd could be pretty CDN. Gnarly, you need access to the internet in order to like... You'd have to create element. Else. You'd have yeah. to like create element yeah. and blah, blah. Like you'd have to it write very weird code. Like you wouldn't would write code that you would traditionally think of as React, right? I saw a comment about that on Twitter today. I won't call the individual out, just because they probably don't want to be, but they were talking about that, that pattern of writing, instead of writing like JSX, writing the, the function react.create element is actually like a hyperscript function that takes in three arguments mm -hmm. and does mm -hmm. things with them. And they called out writing that um, for the past couple of years and really enjoying that and thinking they made the best decision versus oh, wow. just writing <laughs> JSX directly. Hmm. Interesting. Wow. Yeah, that is very interesting. That is, that is I would say a person who is very patient Maybe she, yeah. Yeah. maybe she should consider a role in teaching. Does not have a lot of nested components as well. You just <laughs> yeah. I yeah. understand the, the appeal of it. Um, I would definitely rename it to something else like H, but I don't know. At the end of the day, like I'm just faster. Like it, it's easier to analyze code for my, for my eyes specifically. Um, so I'm, I'm talking anecdotally, but it, it's easier for me to just look at JSX and know what's going on. Whereas I feel like I would be lost looking at hyperscript calls over and over. I think like what led up to React in in the way like you know when I was at a pen to building require JS and doing all these things like we we sort of painted ourselves into a corner of like needing build tools anyways for, for stuff even if you're able to write JSX vanilla React in a browser like are you gonna I mean maybe now you could go vanilla CSS too it's a little easier to write CSS now than ever before but that wasn't true until not that long ago and there's still I mean like we still have a lot of IE11 traffic, y'all, unfortunately. Like, we're, we're finally on the cusp of, like, turning that stuff off. But something has to run first to make your code be able to run everywhere. And it's just sort of has to happen. And so, like, why not just also throw JSX compilation into the mix, too? It's mm. just, it's not even that slow, really. It's just converting 
some ASTs for, of a, this into a function call, mm -hmm. right into function call. So, you know, to me, it's like, it's just kind of build tool is just part of it now, part of the job. I mean, like it or not at some level. Yeah, it's like a necessary part of the job anyway, yeah. in order to like write like code that can be supported on multiple browsers and perform like performs well and right. So the, I don't personally see a world we aren't where we aren't running build tools on our JavaScript code, right? Um, I think the concern is more like the local development workflows personally, like for me, have like greatly been impacted by this. And I think sure. we'll we'll get into some of the tooling in the next segment. But, you know, I think there's also a bunch of skills needed to have like a uh, an entry point into modern web dev now. Mm -hmm. And that's like mm -hmm. not very inclusive because you're asking people who are learning the language and learning the the jargon to now like learn ops, you know, well, now learn how yeah. to manage config files. And that's where this whole thing came up is it's like, I don't want my devs having to come in and learn all that stuff. I'll take care of that for you. That's put that on me. I love that stuff. I'll do that all day. I'll write you a webpack config right now if you want one. I love doing that stuff. I don't know why. It's, I just geek out so hard on it. And I want like I want the junior engineers coming out of you know wherever or just starting. If you if you just listen to this podcast and you're like I, I don't know you know all this stuff. It's like it's okay. Come to me and let's talk. I'll help you get going. And then over time, I can teach you like more about this and, and why it's important and how it works. But ultimately, especially at least definitely within the context of my company, is like, I just want my feature teams to go make Eventbrite like the best possible live events ex experience on the internet. And, and I don't want you to have to worry about your Webpack config and your Babel config and, and your ES modules and your whatever, whatever, whatever. It's like, I got you. That's, that's my job. There's something to be said about like the increase in the number of uh, zero config type tooling. Sure. So for example, like, sure, maybe 10 or 20 years ago, writing front end code was like fairly straightforward. You write a single file, maybe a CSS file, and then later on you throw in JavaScript or whatever. Um, and you don't need tooling for that. And then obviously it's it's become more complex where you have Webpack and earlier there was Grunt and Gulp and so on. But in the advent of tooling, like at least at the beginning stages, there was not a lot of boilerplate code that you could just use and run with like you'd still have to write your own grunt you'd still have to write your own gulp whatever and webpack and and so on but i think and this is sort of me endorsing frameworks to 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 an extent because i think frameworks have actually helped there's an argument both both sides but i think in terms of like create react app let's say it has given people the, the ability to just run create react app it creates a boilerplate for you and then you can just run with it like obviously there's an overhead in terms of learning gsx and whatever but that tends to come with frameworks but i mean it's sort of a trade off right like would you rather learn gsx or would you rather understand how to write a webpack config <laughs> and for a lot of people gsx is sort of very similar to html not the same obviously but it is a path to working faster than it is to like understand all the config and I think that's actually really interesting in terms of how the industry has moved towards. And I think that's a positive because mm -hmm. it means that people don't have to learn a lot of this. And if they want to, they can, because yeah. at least with Create React App, you are working off of that like boilerplate. And then if you really want to, you can extend the config. And if you want to go one level further, you can just eject completely, which is obviously not recommended because you don't get further updates. But if you have very specific needs, you can do that. And that obviously means that you're full on in the deep end, which is like what you do, Jonathan, which is like completely updating Webpack, understanding every yeah. intricacy of that process. And so I think there's like a wide spectrum in terms of the way in which you can enter front end today. Yeah. Well, and what's interesting about that too is like, you're right, frameworks, like that's part of why like Next.js and Gatsby are so good and so popular. It's like, you don't have to worry about that stuff. But I think a lot of what's interesting is that companies like Eventbrite and like, you know, Google or whoever, to people that have been around for a minute, like we've had to go through transformations where like we started with Backbone and Marionette and all that. Actually, before that, it was just like I said, iffies to like Backbone to require mm -hmm. then to React and shoving React inside Backbone and then now taking React out and doing only React. Like it was sort of hard to find a, a breaking point to just say, OK, hey, we're switching to Angular here and, and Angular can do everything. We was like we picked up React because we saw React was happening. And it and really back then, four years ago, when Eventbrite switched to React, it's like there wasn't 
like a good React framework back then. I mean, Create React App wasn't a thing, and and Next.js definitely wasn't a thing. Maybe it was. So I think like from that perspective, we sort of just all had to find uh, the ways to to take what we had done and sort of build our own little frameworks around them. And then that's where two teams like like my team got created. It's like front end infrastructure mm-hmm. now has to manage, you know taking us into the future, uh, or taking the company into the future with React. Cool. Uh, just to kind of close out this section, I had one more question, and it's just where would you delineate the difference between DevOps and DevOps? Like, is it strictly like JavaScript tooling is is DevOps and then everything else might be DevOps? Or like, you know, like repo management can be something that a team takes advantage of, for example. Like, which side would that be on? And what are your thoughts on YAML? <laughs> uh, well, we're switching to shots Circle fired. C- yeah, we're <laughs> we're switching to Circle CI right now, so we do a lot of YAML. Nice. So I would say the, the it's a very blurry line. The ideal line, uh, and this is one that uh, I had at Lonely Planet where I came from before Eventbrite, which is really great. Is like we partnered with our DevOps team to have them help us create some infrastructure patterns and paradigms to where. They sort of did for us what I'm doing for my engineering customers from the front end. It's like they would create, you know, if you copy this Jenkins file, you know, there's a couple of macros in here that'll build your stuff. And then, you know, just put this Kubernetes manifest. Uh, and so like that sort of give and take between DevOps and then my world is like, I, I understand the DevOps flows and in in how to create my own infrastructure when I need to. I don't necessarily need to get into like networking VPCs and, you know, routing HTTP traffic, like I can, and, and I like to understand that stuff, but that partnership with DevOps and, or SRE is, is, I think, the ideal place where we can kind of create like an API for like anything else. And, and, and like the same thing I'm talking about with this tooling stuff is like, how do I work with the DevOps team and what, what, what levels, what point touch points do we have and sort of building that understanding between the two. Oh, that's super cool, Jonathan. I think what's really interesting for me is this convergence of like these two worlds that in previous lives never talked to each other, right? right? Like you have like Opsy, Infra, Cloud, CI folk, and you have folks who are writing, you know, uh, JavaScript that are maybe at the tip of the spear, right? So yep. it's, it's this really nice full circle with DevOps. So thank you so much for talking to us about this cool topic and we'll, we'll get into tooling and all the other fun stuff you kids can't wait for next. What's up, JS Party people? Have you ever wondered if you could be offering a faster, less buggy experience for your customers? Well, with Raygun Air and Performance Monitoring, you have all the information you need at your fingertips to quickly find and fix errors and performance issues across your tech stack down to the line of code. Raygun makes it easy to monitor the impact of your performance improvements, quickly identify issues across web and mobile apps, and see how your code performs in the hands of your customers. This saves you time, this saves you money, and this saves your sanity. Head to Raygun.com to join thousands of customer-centric software teams who use Raygun every single day. Again, Raygun.com to give them a try with a free 14-day trial. So Jonathan, yes, that was a really cool insight into DevOps. And with Divi uh, kind of mentioning this separation of, I think, concerns where Create React App has been created to like abstract away all of the complexity around, you know, managing your configs and lets you focus on just learning the tool. And, you know, it's, it's, it's really nice that I think the community at large is starting to take that. Um, we've seen even just with Webpack 4, you know, over you know many years ago there was um i think they introduced the zero configs there as well you know so i've been ra- around long enough to remember karma was a tool mm-hmm. that like mm-hmm. was super widely adopted and is still widely adopted today because of the way legacy stuff works but you know i was like the one person that had to set up all the configs for all my teams because no one ever really got it like docs mm-hmm. were pretty poor like you know it just we've we've come a long long way in terms of 
tooling defaults, et cetera. But can you kind of give us an overview of like what you consider to be really the best in class kind of tooling landscape for front end teams um, in 2020? Like if I was starting a project today, what sure. would I need? Yeah. And how should we go about setting it up? Yeah. So, I mean, uh, what's interesting is Webpack 5 just came out a few days ago, which introduced a lot of things. You brought up Webpack 4 kind of converting into the, um, you know, you basically you can just say Webpack dash P or Webpack dash D and it just sort of has same defaults, which is great. Mm -hmm. So from that perspective, yeah, you've got a lot of options now. Parcel is another big one that I think uh, that was sort of the whole mantra behind par Parcel was no config, if at least at first. I know then Jamie Kyle came in and kind of added a little bit of config because like there were some needs there. Parcel 2 is going to be even more incredible in, in terms of uh, what they're looking to do with Parcel 2. So I think Parcel's big. I know eventually for teams that can and can not support legacy stuff, Snowpack sounds pretty dang cool. I think like IE 11 is still a crutch there. Or at least it was last time I checked. I don't remember. But yeah, so there's a, there's a lot of great things out there still to or, or, and coming out and new things. You know, Babel obviously is has gotten so good now that it can even transpile TypeScript. Which I know you guys talked a little bit about that last week with Ben. Because, you know, the TypeScript compiler is really good, but it's like, yeah, you know, it kind of, it doesn't match sometimes with what I, like, I'm already doing all this other stuff in Babel. So the fact that it can now do TypeScript is is fantastic. And then in terms of like, you know, other tooling that, um, that we're using at Eventbrite that I would say is pretty, um, you know, useful industry-wide and, and pretty good standards is um, we have a, a big monorepo actually uh, of, of our front end code, uh, which, you know, say what you want about monorepos. There's, there's definitely contentiousness about monorepos versus multi-repos. But for us, what we have chosen to do with our tooling stack and, and all this DevOps stuff is like, where you're using a tool called Bolt, which is very similar to Lerna, built by the same guy, Jamie. And uh, we're able to, to, to basically, uh, we have about 150 different front end packages. And we can go in and say our design system is in there or tiny little packages that control widgets on the page are in there and then entire applications are in there. And we have tools built um, that can detect, you know, if I change the button in my component system, I can see the downstream effects across my entire repo, which is actually really hard in a multi-repo setup. Like if, unless you're going to write mm -hmm. some crazy tooling to go like, go to all these other different repositories. If I change the button, I get a list of every app that, and every package downstream that touches, uh, that the button is affecting. So I can run my Jest tests against uh, everything downstream, make sure I haven't broken everything. Same for Webpack. Now, uh, if I change the button, I can go run the Webpack builds of all the apps that use the button. And, and the other opposite is true. Like if I'm only touching like, one small widget used by two or three different applications, then the blast radius is a lot smaller. And so you get some better CI wins for that because like most of your builds are pretty smooth and pretty quick because if they're just, you know, most of the teams are focused on what they're focused on. Uh, but then when we have teams that come in and want to make repo wide sweeping changes, like we built that in to be able to confidently say like, I can change, you know, this card display widget and make sure that everything else alongside it gets tested, uh, which is really cool <laughs> and super fun. And took us a, a minute to get right, but it's been really fun. And that's the kind of tooling that like, I just love building that stuff. I just love seeing how that affects people's day to day and the excitement when people get, when like we, we ship an update to it that makes it even better. And they're like, oh guys, this is so, this is so great. So yeah, the monorepo thing has been big. Uh, and I, I think like industry-wide, that's another tool that we've seen grow in popularity because of Lerna and Bolt is, you know, was a kind of a next step for that um, that we're using. But um, yeah, and NX is another big popular monorepo tool. There's a couple different ones out there, but I think the monorepo for front ends is pretty big. Yeah, Microsoft has released Rush recently, um, yep, Rush. which is, mm -hmm. you know, it looks pretty good actually and i think they're using it internally inside of microsoft which is awesome because that means you're getting good support when google has basil uh which is their kind of thing for it like a lot of the big companies have mono repos but you know a, does a startup you know just shipping code need one of those probably not but for a team of you know 
150 engineers. Like it's pretty nice to have the tooling of your monorepo to kind of like help shape it all and, and make it all make sense. And um, so, yeah, I'd say, you know, if you're at a big company and, and you're having trouble kind of keeping everything in sync, the monorepo is a good kind of p- pattern, I would say, for modern build tools. It's very helpful. Uh, it just really helps add some shape and clarity around making changes and confidence. So I really, I really like that, one, that strategy a lot. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think what else industry-wide, like tooling-wise, yeah. While you're thinking, I can clarify something for folks. We'll, we'll get into Snowpack in a bit, but Snowpack does have... I guess we can get into it now, but like Snowpack has a, um, it has interoperability with Webpack um, mm. so that so that you can use Snowpack basically for, it's really geared towards like your local development. Mm-hmm. And, you know, because, you know, you need to support older browsers that maybe don't have ESM and whatever else, like you, you can actually just literally use, you just plug in your Webpack. They have a plugin where you just, you can essentially for production, you just use Webpack to build your production bundles. Hmm. And so for folks who are wondering, like, what is Snowpack? Well, it's uh, we had uh, Fred on the show uh, like a, a little while ago. I don't, I don't remember what episode number, but we'll, we'll link it in the show notes. But Snowpack essentially is this awesome bundler that lets you, it's like ESM first. So it's, it's you know, you, we, you don't need to bundle your JavaScript. Um, and, you know, it's, so it's using native native modules and it takes down like it like drastically improves your local developer workflow because you're 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 able to build things file by file and you know your fans are not going to spin like when you're you know when you're doing a watch and like having to kind of constantly like update your whole bundle update your whole bundle update your whole bundle mm-hmm. um and so snowpack is is really really great uh and a lot of front end teams are uh, starting to adopt it um like we're also considering adopting it for my team and teams at large at my company um and so you know i'd highly recommend looking into it um you know because e- just at minimum even for for local like lo- local development workflow it's like a game changer um so yeah, yeah, I've definitely seen stuff about that. It's one that's one of those ones that's like, man, I need to look at that. I've got it in my ever long to do list of <laughs> right. articles and things I need to learn about. Right. I'm going to throw Nick a bone here, like because I'm going to talk about TypeScript. But like, <laughs> how do you right, like? There's configs around linting, right? Mm-hmm. And there's this kind of suite of tools that are what I like to call like cluster in the same cluster, right? They're mm-hmm. things that are that, you know, have a lot of peer dependencies, right? Like, you, you know, whether it's a Babel preset that requires these versions of Babel core or whether it's, mm-hmm. you know, TypeScript uh, linting rule or, right? There's all these like these clusters, which really, I think for me, make upgrades extremely challenging, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so for example, when Webpack comes out with a major release, right? There's a ton of tools built around Webpack and, you yeah. know, have peer dependencies set. And what are like recommendations for how to kind of manage that? Yeah, that's great. I love that question so much. And TypeScript, because yes. Nick. Yes, because Nick. <laughs> so what's, what we have enforced, which is a little different, and one of the things that Bolt does at, under, at its core, which like, you know, Bolt is, is one thing, like it's, it's like a thing, but at, at its core, what we wanted to enforce with our monorepo was there's a consistent version of every package across the entire repo. Like you can't have multiple versions of React in our world. We don't support it. We don't want it. We want everything to be consistent. So that way we can predict things better. And there's not like forking node module folders, right? Where like this one of the packages in my repo required React 16.9 and the next one required 16.12. Like that causes all these other downstream. It's just crazy. So like literally, if you ask for a Babel plugin at 6.17.1, that's the only one that's going to exist in the repo at any moment, period. Like we don't allow it. We'll fail the build. <laughs> you can't do that. So we enforce that pretty strictly. And in terms of like, you know, that uh, going to the next build pattern or, or the new upgrade and, and dealing with those breaking changes. And even like we do a ton of migrating things like, you know, we've we've gone from Webpack 2 to 3 to 4. And how did that work? Uh, and we've we've moved code around. We write a lot of um, Babel plugins for doing code mods, actually. Uh, which is really powerful and, and fundamental to how Babel itself actually works, is this concept of an abstract, abstract syntax tree, if you're not familiar, ASTs, 
uh, ASDExplorer.com kind of describes it. It's basically a way for you to write code and that code can then get compiled down into a tree of like, you know, this is a variable, this is a function, this is a whatever, whatever, whatever. And then you can easily go in and replace like a function call with something else or whatever. And which is actually how Babel works under the covers and why all of a sudden, you know, I didn't have to use TSC to compile my TypeScript anymore because Babel released their own AST parser for TypeScript, uh, which was super handy because now I can use Babel preset A and V and Babel preset TypeScript and Babel preset common JS to whatever or dynamic imports. And you can kind of combine these Babel plugins into something that makes sense for what your team's targeting. You know, like we still got to support i11 at least for a minute. Hopefully we're going to kill that maybe in 2021. I don't know. Hopefully we'll see. Or, and, and you know, we want to support private fields or whatever. Like you can do all that kind of stuff because under the covers, you're, you're using these cool AST things. Um, and so our team actually has written several different ASTs to help us convert from old things to new things and, and do those upgrades. Like going to, uh, oh gosh, one of the biggest projects I worked on here at Empire was actually taking us from React 15 to 16. It was actually kind of hard. It took a while because there was like, you got to make sure nobody's using the wrong prop types thing anymore. Then you got to go in and upgrade some of these different libraries. And so we had to write some code that writes code to help that upgrade path. And so if you're a team who manages a lot of code like we do in front of infrastructure, I cannot stress the same importance and the usefulness of doing something like ASTs. It even helps because ESLint also is actually using ASTs too. You can write ESLint plugins to verify, you know, if there's certain patterns at your company that you want to enforce, you can write ESLint plugins to to help enforce that kind of stuff. Like there's all kinds of cool stuff that you can do with it. Yeah, uh, yeah, automation for the win. I think you're you're taught you're preaching to the choir in this group. We all yes. love ASCs and <laughs> yeah. like just in general, like yeah, using using automation as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Like for sure. And I think automation is the key there. So so the yeah. question was like, how do you manage like you know upgrading things? It's automation. It's automation and yeah. verification. You know, making sure. Right. And you know, repeatability, I guess, is the big right. thing with ASTs because you know you can just run it on your whole code base. If you get something wrong, just get check out, update your transform, run it on your whole code base again. You know, yeah. And it's, it's just, funny, like I didn't used to feel this way. I used to get really nervous, but I do like nine thousand file long commits all the time now. Like it's like, yeah, whatever, it's no big deal yeah. anymore. Just, yeah, yeah, just change nine thousand files and commit it. Yeah, <laughs> whatever. Because you, I have that confidence now that like I'm not going to screw anything up. It's and it's not just like finding and replacing, which half the time I try to do that, I just like break VS code. I tried to find and replace something across like every file in our repo. And it took like 30 minutes for VS code to do it. And it took a, it took an AST that ended up writing like 30 seconds to just scan the entire repo and change it. Done. Safe updates, right? Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, no, ASTs are amazing for like precision. Um, I just, one thing I want to know for folks wondering like, why the Babel trans compiler is better, you know, for transpiling your TypeScript. We talked about this a little bit in Ben's show, but we can get into it now. Um, it's basically, Babel has a lot, like they're essentially an implementer on the TC39 uh, in the sense that like the same way V8 implements JavaScript, like Babel is considered uh, one uh, like an implementation of JavaScript because they actually like make polyfills and they do transpiling, and they also deal with like managing bugs and uh, uh, idiosyncrasies between browsers, right? And so there's so much like wealth there. Like trying to replace Babel at this point is like you know you have to catch up to all the bug fixes and you know there's so much that they're handling. It's a good separation of concerns to use Babel to transpile and TypeScript to type check, right? And not TypeScript to mm -hmm. compile. And so, you know, it's, um, you, you just, you just get a lot more benefits there. And so it's, it's just, I was yeah. really glad that like, yeah, that when, when yeah. the, uh, Babel ad types like merged, like that was just great. Yeah, I, I agree. That's the workflow we, we also adopted. Same. TypeScript did a lot of really cool things around, like if you're just kind of, Again, doing just, you know, basically you just want to use TypeScript and you just want to ship something and you don't care all that much. TSC is probably going to be fine, especially with some of the composite project stuff that they have now where it will only recompile like the stuff you change. Like they have that built into TypeScript now. 
in terms of like making things faster to my local dev. Like it's pretty good. But yeah, like as part of an, a larger ecosystem, um, we use TSC to type check and dump d.ts files out to the file system that we can ship with our packages. Because that's the one thing that Babel can't do yet that I'm aware of is generate the TypeScript definition files, which is very useful because uh, if you are creating a package that you want, you know, those type definitions to be on for your autocomplete in your IDE, it's important to, to do that TSC step to get those type definitions. And the funny thing is, is TSC is running in the background of VS Code anyways for you. <laughs> That's why VS Code rocks as hard as it does is because like whether or not you're using TypeScript at your company, if you're just like, I just, I use JavaScript. And then I'm like, are you using VS Code? And they're like, yeah. I'm like, no, you're actually using TypeScript because it's, it's whether or not you like it, it's, it's taking your JavaScript and running it through the TypeScript compiler, analyzing your code. And telling you, hey, you missed this, you you misspelled this, and that, that's TypeScript. That's the power of their compiler, but, which yeah. is powered by ASTs. <laughs> which is powered by AST, exactly. Yeah, so and they bringing it own, all back. <laughs> yeah, they have like a there. It's crazy. If you ever just go look, I've just dug into to TypeScript before through the compiler. It's insane. God, it's insane. It's and it's a massively different way of looking at ASTs than Babel does too. It's literally like just this huge long file is the TypeScript compiler that they just like. Oh, it's crazy. It's fun though. I love it. I have a question from a, a workflow standpoint. So when you're when you're setting up these tools and like maybe as as somebody who works more directly on the front end, uh, but they have a change that they want to make, maybe a config change or a tooling change or bringing in some new tooling, like how does that work? Does it go to you as a ticket or like, I'm just curious about the del delineation. Like I asked about DevOps and DevOps sure. now, front end and DevOps. Yeah, yeah, sure. That's a great question. So we leverage uh, the code owner's cool. file pretty heavily at Eventbrite. And so we on the front end infrastructure team own everything that is not owned explicitly by a team. So we have certain teams that own like the packages, you know, whatever this folder or this folder, that folder. And then everything else falls through to us. But what that means is like we just had, I had a, a guy from our Madrid office come in and say, hey, I noticed that the storybook add-ons ticket that you guys had put into GitHub a while ago uh, has a help wanted tag. Can I help? And I'm like, absolutely. That's why I put that label on there. And so I, cause I, I don't like, I want to manage this stuff. I want to own this stuff, but we want to treat our, our monorepo uh, as like an open source yeah. project. You know, I, we are the owners of it, but we want our teams who are interested in it and have a bent towards the same mindset that I do as this infrastructure stuff come and contribute. Yeah, absolutely. Like we'll get the, it'll, my name's going to be attached to the pull request as a code owner. Uh, and, and I'll see it and, and then, yeah, just approve, merge me. We have a, we have a merge pipeline that we manage. They just type merge me and it sends it off to Jenkins and merges it in. And, and then there you go. And, and then that person gets to have contributed to the entire front ecosystem at, of Eventbrite. So yeah, very encouraged. We definitely push hard on telling teams like, don't just treat this as like Jonathan, Kyle and Alex's project. Like this is everyone's thing. If you find areas where it sucks, tell us and, and fix it with us and work, work at it together. No. Wow. Yeah, that, that, that's so incredible. I mean, I love. I also love that y'all are using the GitHub owners uh, files because mm -hmm. I'm assuming because you're a monorepo. So you use the GitHub owners file to like, you know, figure out who should be tagged on pull requests and like who should approve X, Y, Z. And like, that's a little bit into DevOps a tiny bit, right? It intersects. Yeah, like, yeah, do you guys like lock down certain files, like your package JSONs or like, I'm just curious, like who gets, like who gets tagged on certain reviews always, like from your team? Mm -hmm. We have a coder, uh, Jamie built a code owner's enforcer uh, package that actually helps with it too. So like if something goes into the re repository that doesn't get added to the code owner's file, the build fails. Like every, every folder has to have an owner. Every single folder. Mm -hmm. Well, every, at least at a top level, top yeah. level. Okay. I was going to say every package, you know, not, not like down to source components, whatever, but every, like the, the package at the, that level does. Yeah. No, that's amazing. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I mean, e e DevOps automating code ownership. This is uh super yes. cool. It's all about automating. Automate it all. Kyle likes to say that he likes to automate the pain away. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. That's amazing. Uh, I think I need to give Kyle my phone number. <laughs> <laughs>
This episode is brought to you by DigitalOcean, Droplets, Managed Kubernetes, Managed Databases, Spaces, Object Storage, Volume Block Storage, Advanced Networking like Virtual Private Clouds and Cloud Firewalls, Developer Tooling like the Robust API and CLI to make sure you can interact with your infrastructure the way you want to. DigitalOcean is designed for developers and built for businesses. Join over 150,000 businesses that develop, manage, and scale their applications with DigitalOcean. Head to do.co slash changelog to get started with a $100 credit. Again, do.co slash changelog. So what you described uh, is actually very similar to uh, what happens at the company I'm at. We have uh, a team like that, that that works on also a monorepo. We're, le- we're using Lerna for that, but very much mm-hmm. a monorepo to you know manage the, making sure we're all on the same version of React, using the same version of TypeScript, things like that. And some of the things that they do are kind of, I'd say like almost doing spikes to like figure out the future of things or, or maybe like, you know, analyzing where things might go from an architectural standpoint across like all of the projects that we're doing. Is that something that that you would also put into the role of DevOps uh, traditionally? Yeah, this is something that we've been sort of trying to figure out even within our own team is like, how do we draw the lines between like the system sort of side of DevOps and kind of the, the front, the actual like architecture side of DevOps, like I love both sides of that. And so it's it's actually very hard still in my own head. Like I like doing both. So I don't know. Uh, I will say functionally, yes, we do have a lot of input into the architecture that goes in to the monorepo itself. Like not only are we trying to help make sure that the build tools and system that actually put everything together work, we are also trying to help steer, you know, Right now we have 95 different applications. Like they're all using React, they're all using Redux. Like, should we squish those into a few and maybe have like Next.js sort of orchestrate those things together? And should we use Redux form anymore? Like we use Redux form pretty heavily. Should we switch to something else? So we're using, um, we've been having a lot of conversations in our front end guild meetings about using, uh, take, stopping using Redux form as much and switching to hooks. Cause now we can use hooks for a long time we couldn't use hooks because we were stuck on Rack 15.8 or whatever it was before 16. So like that side of my head has to also kind of be on its game a lot of the time too, because I get asked about those questions. And then I get asked to do mentoring, you know, because I've been doing this for 10 years. So then I'm also mentoring folks on like how application architecture should work while still maintaining that stack. So yeah, I think it, I think it does fit in. It's a, it's a wide umbrella, uh, this DevOps thing, which is, Part of why I like calling it out and just that awareness of like everything that I have to deal with, just like writing it down. It's like, okay, those are the things. And I can kind of just sort of visualize, visualize it all now, um, which is great. Yeah, I really like the idea of a team dedicated to improving the productivity of everybody else on the team, because otherwise that stuff just kind of mm-hmm. gets pushed to the side a lot or it happens, you know, not as yeah. part of your regular assigned tasks and it's hard to get that that assigned. So it's really good that there's somebody looking out for that or a team looking out for the best interests of like the development experience while not taking away from the developers actually working on like the user experience and things like that. So it's, it's really beneficial from right. my standpoint. And what's, what's so interesting about what you just said also is like my team is doing all that we're doing. And sometimes what we want to do is, is actually step away for a second and let the feature teams kind of talk and discuss like best practices that they're seeing um, and making sure that we're facilitating communication across all the different front end teams. So that way, you know, when we're dealing with front end teams in in Mendoza, Argentina and front end teams in Madrid and front end teams in San Francisco, front end teams in Nashville. And so part of our role is also we have these weekly guild meetings where everybody that's really interested in front end uh, at large, not just infrastructure comes together we talk and, you know, a lot of times it inadvertently comes, becomes the front end in for hour, which we don't want it to be because like we want to hear from everyone using the stuff we're using so that we can help facilitate like, you know, what is evolving as best practices inside of Eventbrite 
And then also like what we're seeing in the industry. So we can kind of help shape those best practices for the teams and, and maybe put in some new lint rules to help inform like, you know, this is not the right way to use hooks. Don't, don't do that. You know, and so that way we get consistency because people jump from team to team uh, inside of Eventbrite. And we want, and even we want new hires to come in and see, you know, not have to have like a massive onboarding period of like learning how front end works at Eventbrite. Like, no, we just want to use industry standard practices so that anybody can come in from any company and just sort of get it. Oh, okay. They're using hooks and like, here's some Redux. Yeah, the Redux is whatever, but you know, it's, we get it. It, it makes sense. So helping sort of set up some fences around that architecture. I love how customer oriented you are, by the way. <laughs> I you. mean, no, like any That comes good... from my product manager, Barrett. Uh, yeah. He's, he's an incredible guy. That's awesome. Yeah. Throughout the course of my career, I've been the, at the benefit of having a lot of good project and product managers mm-hmm. that help me do that. And so we constantly are, are focused and inside of Eventbrite. Like that's our, one of our big mantras is trying to, make our, the, our lives of our customers better, whether that be on the feature team for, you know, the, the, the folks creating events or in the case of like our foundations teams, helping those engineers just live better lives and, and have fun writing code. You know, no one wants to wake up every morning, especially now we're all at home. Nobody wants to just wake up and, and hate the, the environment that you're working in. So, you know, we want to make it better. Yeah, no, that's super cool. I'm just impressed. <laughs> <laughs> like the culture of like good ops folks, like traditional DevOps people or SRE, like they're extremely customer oriented and mm-hmm. like there's this strong communication factor because they're typically the ones coordinating a bunch of teams that are very siloed mm-hmm. and you're the like common denominator. Yeah. And so I just love that you're advocating for that. And I think it's just great for people to hear like that you, you all have that culture at Eventbrite because it gives people hope, you know, because uh, yeah. siloing is a big problem uh, the larger oh. your company gets. So you know, yeah. and nobody has it perfect. I mean, you know, if you look at Google, like Google feels like 700 companies really outside if you mm-hmm. like to the external person, uh, because, you know, it's like, wait, did, did they not know that like messages exists already? Like there's, why are there like seven other messaging platforms that seem to be cannibalizing each other? You know, yeah. but there's just like <laughs> the, weird silos, you know? <laughs> the silo thing is, boy, that rings so, so true for me that we had that problem where I came from at, at Lonely Planet occasionally where like we had folks in Australia. It's in the name. Just kidding. <laughs> yeah. yeah well. <laughs> Just kidding. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and when I got to Eventbrite, like I was like, I don't want that culture. Uh, and, and especially now everyone's remote. Everyone's working from home. And I've most of, I've been lucky, I guess, also that I've done a lot of remote work. And when I was at Pen2 for years, we were really good about staying in touch and communicating. And uh, yeah, like we had folks seven hours ahead in Madrid. And so I committed myself to waking up at seven my time and being online for three or four hours of crossover with that team because I want to be able to help them solve their problems if they have it. And then I'm online for the last few hours of San Francisco's day. So like I'm, I'm in a good time zone, I guess, too, uh, luckily, because uh, then the Mendoza folks are an hour ahead. So yeah, it's, it's facilitating that communication across teams and making sure everybody's kind of on the same page. And, and it's not like we don't want to, one of the things I think people are afraid of is when we started down this path, is like that we're going to like force you to like follow our standards and just like rule with this iron fist. Like this is how things are done. But that's quite the opposite of what we wanted. We want people to just feel like this is everybody's thing. This is, you know, we're working on all this together. We want input from anybody that wants uh, to, to be involved to help shape this. This is your work environment. You know, we feel like we have the capability to sort of stay in touch with industry best standards and help keep, you know, moving us forward. So that way we're trying not to have to maintain tons of legacy code and maintainability, all that stuff. But yeah, it's, it's no silos, please. I think like it's interesting to think about because a lot of the like it's unique the company that you're at where you're sort of like split into like your focus is on tooling and front end tooling. And then there are different teams that are probably more UI focused and like building Mm -hmm. components and whatever else. Yes. But it's, it's interesting because oftentimes when you think about the front end tools that you use, it it affects everyone. Like if you work on front end, you're going to have to think about tooling at some point, but Mm -hmm. how do you make decisions like how much agency do teams have because you've mentioned you have a front-end guild there are lots of people who get to chime in but overall like how does the decision decision get made because you own the tooling in your team sure. 
And then the front end, like a specific front end team that's working on this particular component might be like, we need to use this particular tool to move forward. But do they yes. have the agency to do that? Or is it something that they have to review with your team and then your team approves and then sort of moves towards implementation? That's an awesome question. And we've had that happen uh, quite a bit. So like one of the big efforts was a team really, really wanted to to roll with some Cypress testing. Mm-hmm. And I thought it had been something on my radar for a good bit. And I hadn't been able to experiment with it. And they just sort of showed up with some, here, this is what we think would look good. And then our team's like, cool, you know, and we are, again, since we're the owners of the stuff, we see all the PRs and we have just to talk with them and we're like, yeah, this looks good. Approve, go ahead and merge. And then they help us maintain it. And and then for like standards wise, we've actually recently started this practice of writing what we call ADRs or architecture decision records. And uh, there's a couple of groups inside of Event right now sort of meeting to come up with those. So a silly example is like, should it be underscore underscore fixtures as a directory name? And then we'll write down some pros and cons of that and then have lots of people go in and read it and approve it. And then we'll all merge it together. So everybody's sort of feeling good about that. So we'll write these ADRs about new ideas we have. That's another sort of good change agent for like making sure people feel like they're a part of, you know, make shaping the thing. And mm-hmm. it's not just for an infrastructure, put this new thing in. I think it's to, you know, to the point earlier about being customer centric. Like, I think we've built up a lot of trust with folks, like, because we do focus so much on the customers and making sure everybody's happy that like, in general, the front end community trusts us to make the right call, which is huge. I mean, like, you know, if we say this is probably the right path, that's, we generally get good. And if there is an outlier that's like, you know, I don't know, this doesn't seem to make sense. We just talk it out and, and figure it out. And I, it's been really, really great, uh, actually. Yeah. So I was just going to ask if you had an RFC process like a few <laughs> yeah, minutes ago. Yeah. I yeah. was like, I wonder if you have that because that's like the sanest way to do this that's democratic and not like, dicti- like it's benevolent dictator in a, like, stressing on the benevolent part, right? Like, yes. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's, Allowing for change. And so uh, we have the ADR process. Uh, We also created some GitHub issue templates for folks to go in and create bugs or feature requests. And so like we've got a feature request in for like, you know, we need offline testing, you know, for for, to try to speed up CI because these Mm -hmm. integration tests take way too long. It's like, cool. That combined with some stuff I had picked up from some conferences and suddenly we're doing this really cool Cypress testing thing where we're doing user flow testing with scenarios and um, and that all sort of came from feedback that we got from a GitHub issue. Mm-hmm. So uh, we, we use uh, GitHub projects to sort of manage those issues that are coming in and labels and just letting people feel like they can contribute. Yeah, no, that's that's so that's so wonderful. Yeah. So this is why I when I wish everything was open source mm-hmm. because I think people could really get insights into uh, like productive workflows at scale. Mm-hmm. You know, yes. and uh, you know it would be awesome. <laughs> like, and that's why I created this DevOps sort of community because that's awesome. I, I'm tired of like you know, you guys doing your thing over here. And, and talk, I mean, to about silos again, like we've siloed mm-hmm. ourselves at different companies too. Companies, which is sort yeah. of unfortunate. Like I love when I get in like our DevOps group, we've had a few meetings now. And so Ben came to the DevOps group that we had a month ago and talked about what they're doing at Stitch Fix. And he pointed to some specific things that I'm like, oh, great, I'm doing that here too. So like, I feel validated, like I made the right choice, uh, you know? So it's it, there's that validation aspect of the community too. So, because sometimes it just feels like you're just in this vacuum of, and you know, like I'm making stuff up as I go. And then when you get a group of people that do the same thing together in the same room and you find out, oh, they're doing that too. That's awesome. Or or they're doing that too, but slightly differently. And then you're like, oh, I didn't think about it from that angle. You know, the Shopify team, there's a guy from the Shopify team in DevOps and he was talking about their merge pipeline that they do. And I'm like, that's awesome. Like we have a merge pipeline too. It looks different from yours, but now you can help me sort of shape what it looks like, could look like at Eventbrite. It's like, I need some insights from other people from different places. It's all about diversity and, and thoughts and getting, getting all kinds of different ideas. Different inputs. Yeah, that's so cool. I didn't realize that the community that you were starting was like 
also kind of a mind share between mm-hmm. people it for is. best practices. It was not just like a support group because I thought it was like an emotional support group, quite <laughs> frankly. Um, yeah. But yeah, no, that's that's awesome. Consider consider me a new member because like I, I love nerding out about automation and, and I use like every, you know ba- yeah. everything from from Bash to ASTs to yeah, just uh, been around the f- JavaScript world long enough to have known you know just. The, seen the patterns evolve, so mm-hmm. it's it's nice to kind of have some of that um, grandma knowledge to bring to this uh, <laughs> to this group. I am curious you know? though, like one thing that does come up, like if you've been doing this for a while, which you have, you said you, you've been doing this for ten years, and Amal mm-hmm. has been doing it for a really long time. One of the things, like as someone who's also been doing it for a while, like going from Grunt to Gulp to Webpack and then now Snowpack, and there's also like people talk about JavaScript fatigue a lot, which is this constant moving from tool to tool Mm -hmm. which also brings up the question which i think we we touched on during the break a little bit which is like are we adding complexity where complexity is not needed and is there a way in which we can move forward where we're not completely obliterating like because front-end infrastructure is going to be a thing people are going to always want to bundle and transpile and as long as that exists this sort of work will exist but is there a way and a path forward where we can sort of make it streamlined because i i think it is a luxury to have a team dedicated to front-end infrastructure and i don't think that that's something every team can do so like is there a way that do you see a a future in which this is sort of like easy for people to get into and like deepen their knowledge without like having to know everything right i think like it kind of comes back to uh, i heard this quote once when i was learning about all these different design patterns in yeah, somebody said something like design patterns aren't created, they're discovered. Mm. And I sort of think that's sort of true for the this build stuff as well. Like without us gone, having gone crazy out there on these webpack configs that are like a thousand lines mm-hmm. long, we wouldn't have arrived on what that webpack dash P mode does, right? Like we had to kind of go crazy for a little bit. And I mean, I sort of think we have reached a point at which the the innovation is sort of leveled out a little bit. Like Snowpack is a more recent one, but you know, mm-hmm. it's finally that JS fatigue. I remember like going to conferences a couple of years ago. It was like every talk was about JS fatigue, and I, I've seen less of that now. Which I think we're finally getting over that hump to a certain extent because we've just people went off and innovated, and now we've sort of found those common denominators about what things need to be there. And then now that's why you're seeing frameworks like Next yep. and Gatsby and Create React App and Create Next App and all these things become more popular. Um, and then like maybe the evolution of that is, you know, we talked a little bit of break again is about like where mm-hmm. do we go in the future is maybe tools like Rust can come in and help speed things up and, and, yeah. and who knows what's going to happen next. Yeah, it's, it's interesting you brought that up because we actually, like especially with Babel, there are a lot of people talking about how Babel is, it is complex and sometimes it's really slow and there's a lot of issues with it. And and half of, part of it is implementation. Part of it is also just community, how much time you can put into open source, blah, blah, blah. But it's it's interesting to see JavaScript tooling move in a, in a direction that I just never thought that it would move into, which is now you see Rust coming into the fore. So you have things like SWC that allows you to do TypeScript checking for you, which is way faster than Babel. Um, which mm-hmm. I think sort of almost to to Nick's question, like moves into this completely, it sort of takes DevOps and DevOps and it it's it's almost like DevOps moves in that direction really quickly because as we see people moving towards picking other languages other than JavaScript to write tooling, then is that even front end anymore? <laughs> because that's almost yeah. full on DevOps at that point. Yeah, that's a great call out. And again, just kind of comes back to the whole thing. Like, what, what am I? What is my job description? I'm writing, I'm a front end infrastructure person, not using front end, not writing front end at that point. But I, I think, you know, it kind of is just like picking a framework. Mm-hmm. Like some frameworks make sense for you, some don't. You know, we 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 did the pick your own adventure game with React and Redux, uh, and it kind of goes for tooling too. Like, if you're fine, if you're hitting bottlenecks in your tooling, like you're probably not going to be hitting bottlenecks in in speed. You know, just building some landing pages, marketing pages, mm-hmm. a little e-commerce site. That's probably not a problem. But a big company is like we are, where we're dealing with ten thousand JavaScript files. You know, if you're hitting that performance bottleneck, something like Rust or Go might make sense. It's a new thing to learn but it's going to solve some of those performance bottlenecks. But it's about picking and meeting the problem where it's at and not just creating problems that don't exist mm-hmm. yet. 
Like if you're not dealing with 10,000, 50, 100,000 file projects, Rust and Go probably don't make sense yet. At least not yet. Maybe in a year or so, there'll be some more incredible Go and Rust tooling for front end. We're getting there though. Mm -hmm. Um, But picking the tool that makes sense for you and your team where you're at is what's important, I think. Just like picking a framework. Yeah. Yagni is, uh, never gets old, right? (laughs) Don't, you know. You ain't yeah. gonna need it, but also like uh, yeah. don't don't pre optimize. And right. I I personally think we really have a problem in our community. That's it's a side effect of being an engineer. I think yeah, you know. So it's everybody's got this problem, but it, in varying degrees. You know, like I, like some people have it worse than others. But you know, the need to kind of want to over engineer. One of my favorite talks from Kent C. Dodds is his aha thing, where it's like avoid mm. hasty abstractions. Mm-hmm. Um, like, and it's so yes. true. Just don't abstract until you need it. Don't go crazy doing things until you find there's a need. And, and doing small things is okay. Like, just iterate and add value as you go. You know, you don't have to boil the ocean at first. Yeah, I, I honestly think code reviews have made that problem. I think people feel the need to have everything perfect on the first iteration. Yeah, you know? and I, and I think it's just it's, you have to remind people that like. First pass, second pass, right? Like, you know, it's it, it, there is a conflict with like wanting to have the perfect PR and mm-hmm. like wanting to iterate, like you know, de- de- deliver it in iterations. Like, it's it's difficult. It's you know, I mean, I feel like uh, the PR workflow doesn't communicate well when something is like V one first pass, you know, mm-hmm. um, versus exactly. like final rubber stamp. And it would be nice to be able to do some more iterative delivery and communicate that more clearly with people. You know, definitely. I just wanted to give you an opportunity to tell us about the logo that you have for DevOps because it's awesome. Oh, yes. Yes. So I was sitting there doodling one day and I, I drew the angle brackets and a hammer and I was like, that kind of looks like Mjornir, the Thor's hammer. And so I sketched something out um, that kind of looked like it. And, and I also, when people ask me what I do that are not tech people, um, I think of I tell them like, yeah, we're kind of like a, like a hammer builder. Like we build hammers for other people to build stuff. Like that's kind of, that's the easiest way I can describe to a non-tech person what I actually do in my job. And so I saw the angle bracket and the hammer. I thought of Mjornir. And then my friend, David Neal uh, on Twitter, he's a uh, really good illustrator, illustrator now. Um, also uh, engineer. Uh, we've, we've known each other for a really long time. And so I threw it at him and he came back with that. And uh, I was really excited about it. He's he's awesome. So if you don't, if you don't follow David, give give him a follow too. He's great. That's awesome. I'll try to link his his profile. Thanks for calling out the logo thing, Nick, because I feel like logos are what make yeah. things official in JavaScript communities. Exactly. You know, yeah, so it's, it's true. not official until there's a logo, yeah, there's a logo. and a website that ends in dev or dot io. <laughs> you mm-hmm. know. Because .com was taken. Just <laughs> yes, and a Discord. <laughs> and a Discord or Slack true. channel, right? Yes. Right, you know. Increasingly yeah. Discord more so than Slack, you know. Yep. Yep. So I'd love to continue conversations with whoever's interested in this stuff. You know, I, I'm on the, you search my name, I'm everywhere. Jonathan Creamer, Jake Creamer 898 and the DevOps community. Like I said, I have a... URL, it's devops.dev. It's gross. It's just like the most basic Gatsby thing ever. So if anybody wants to make it not gross, that'd be awesome. Uh, And then, yeah, then we're doing the Slack community thing and and hanging out in there, just chatting about, you know, somebody asked today some TypeScript questions. I'll probably go in there and answer some TypeScript questions. Um, So yes, definitely feel free to join and chat online. Love to, this is just what I'm passionate about. So I have a burning question before we end. Okay. How do we know that the Slack people, like the Slack people are people in your channel and not bots that have been created by you know, uh, all the DevOps folks, you know? <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good question. How do we know? Do we know? Can we know is the question, really. I see you typing already. Just kidding. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right. Most people that came in gave intros and we said, hey, and we, we meet every now and then to talk. Uh, but yeah, that's a good question. They're, yeah. not, they're not sentient beings. Uh, yeah. Non- well, thank you for answering my question in a serious uh, way. So <laughs> I, I, I really appreciate that you took my question seriously. <laughs> yes, <awesome>. yes. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so with that said, Jonathan, like you are, I would say, 
like gold for any team <laughs> writing JavaScript. <laughs> you and all of your teammates really like. Thank you. We we need to kind of clone you and you know. Um, yeah. Wish more companies had budget for like this role and this focus. You know, uh, it, it makes more sense at scale, but it it really it's a job that needs to be done for anyone that's writing modern web applications. So it just mm-hmm. kind of sucks for smaller companies and smaller teams. Like de- developers are just doing both jobs and, you know, yeah. and uh, like, it's nice to have the luxury of separation, separating those concerns. Mm-hmm. I think if you don't, and you're a company that you, you just don't have that budget, I mean, it's important to just, just sort of formalize it a little, at least to yourselves, like just meet and talk and write things down. That's really the biggest thing. Like for the longest time, I just like, everything was up here in my head to spin it around and I didn't put it on paper. Putting this on paper is, is massively important mm-hmm. for, for not only for yourself, you can just offload your memory into like a different place and remember why you made decisions and come back to them later. Like, Oh God, why was it that I had to install this like Babel module resolver plug? And I completely don't remember. And then you can go back and see, Oh yeah, this is why. So write things down, talk, communicate. It comes back. All I think to communication is, is key in all of this. I also like that you formalize it in terms of just like a process because for so long, like even for me, embarrassingly, when I'm working on tooling, I think I'm not actually doing front end. I'm just like, oh, I'm doing a thing that will allow me to then do the work I need to do. And so like I'll spend a week building like a roll up config and I'll be like, I was supposed to be building this, but I was building this. (laughs) And, and it felt like I actually didn't do any work, Yeah, no. which is interesting because I'm like, if you think about it, that is sort of related. It's And it it's is. not yak shaving, even though people think it is, because it's sort of, it's to some extent it could be. But it's it important yak shaving though. Like yeah. it's, it's, you know, some, you may spend five hours messing around with the config and then you found one thing that was like, oh, that was actually what I needed. And you put it back and yeah. that five hours of yak shaving exploration was actually massively important because mm. it simplified some part of your flow that you, maybe you didn't know existed until you went and explored it. And now you've automated the pain away, you know? Yeah, I, I, I'm really glad that this tagline that I came up with is, uh, is becoming your <laughs> catching up. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't even know. Nick, is it shared credit? I don't, I don't know. All, all I know is that I should be on the bottom of whatever readme file along with Nick and Divya that was invented here, you know? <laughs> TM. <laughs> Just Copyright. <laughs> Copyright. <laughs> you know, but no, TM. no. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's been such a pleasure. And Thank you. Like, yeah, I, I, you know, we hope to have you back on the show yeah, uh, again. Like, because, you know, out. it's an evolving thing. Yeah. Anytime you talk about Webpack, I'll, I'll just show up and just hang out <laughs> just and listen like, to questions. Hey, yo. Or, or build tooling. <laughs> or build tooling. Right, right. Just bring me back. Um, well, we'll link to everything that we talked about in the show notes, uh, including the community, the blog post that kind of started it all. The, you know, you'll get to see the logo. We've got so many links. So with that said, thanks, everyone. We'll see you next week. Props to Amel for killing it on her first time in the driver's seat. If you think she did a good job, maybe shoot her a tweet. She's at Nomad Techie. I think she'd like to hear from you. If you dig this show, you should know that we produce other awesome podcasts just like it. Check out Practical AI, Brain Science, and of course, The Changelog, which we've been doing for over a decade. Learn more at changelog.com slash podcasts. And if you love what we're up to, help us help you by joining Changelog++. It's our membership program, so you can directly support our work and make the ads disappear. Check it out at changelog.com slash plus plus. Thanks again to Breakmaster Cylinder for the beats and our sponsors for having our back, Fastly, Linode, and Longstarkly. That's all for now. We're talking Ionic Framework next week.